we're going to go ahead and get started. Yeah. And as we bring our attention into this space, allow ourselves to settle into our chairs and let go of the busyness of the day and allow our attention to be focused right here, right now. Know that spirit is everywhere, present, whole, perfect, and complete, and that each and every one of us is divinely expressing that presence right here, right now. And that the time that we share together in this class today brings us to a greater understanding of how these ancient holy texts that we call the Bible express that greater truth of spirit in ways that we have not previously understood them. And so I know that this is a blessed endeavor, that our time together unfolds in absolute perfection, and I call it good. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm really I'm grateful that you all are here tonight. Um, and I'm sorry for the, you know, change in schedule. Last week I was still in bed with a fever at this point. Um, I was very, I spent uh, four and a half days in bed. So, um, and it just, it turned out that we, we didn't have our staff retreat this week. So we actually didn't go away, which is why we were skipping this week. Um, and that allowed us to make the class up today instead of adding another week on to the end. Um, so I'm just really grateful for you to be here. Dick has consented, thank you so much, uh, for videoing it for those people who aren't able to make it. Because people had obviously made plans, um, you know, that we knew we were going to take a break and people had made plans. And, and, um, and so RJ worked out with Dick to have him here to, um, to video. So he's going to be videoing the lectures and he'll be turning around and, you know, videoing, videoing you if you have a question or a comment. We won't video the, the table conversations, of course. Um, and, um, and, and anything that you say will, will be used against you. No. <laughs> Can it will be used against you? No. <laughs> and then, um, and then um, RJ will let you know, um, you guys know, if, should you want, you know, should you want to see it. And then we'll let the people who are unable to be here tonight um, um, be able to, you know, that way they can, they can be in on the class and on the conversation, the lecture and stuff like that. So I know it's a little discombobulating, but I was actually grateful that we had this week to, to make up so we didn't have to just keep pushing it um, further back. So I just really am, am glad that you guys were able to organize your schedules to be here. All right. So we are, um, I want to finish up a little bit of a conversation from last week, which we did not get to. Um, and that is the, um, the conversation about the Tower of Babel. Oh, did I bring my, oh, I, didn't bring even, I didn't even bring my bag down. Isn't that weird? Okay, the Tower of, the Tower, no, that's all right. The Tower of Babel, it's, all, it's a very short. It's an it's a, it's a extremely short story. And yet, um, how, many of a, how many of us know this story from our childhood? I mean, it's just one of those, I guess it's one of those images that really stuck. Um, one of those, um, uh, you know, one of those things that we talk about, that people talk about. So, um, from, your, from your reading, your own reading, uh, and the reading in, the, in Marcus Borg, and your own reading of the text itself, why do you think the ta this story, the Tower of Babel, is included? And what do you think the point is? Lynn. So I think, I think the, the question they were trying to answer was, why are there so many languages? You know, why, you know, why are people different? And of course, they blamed it on God. Right. <laughs> and um, so that this was this was just one one more way where they were just trying to fit themselves into the context where they saw themselves. Good. And and um, and a lot of the um, stories that we have from all um, sh traditions, all um, 
um, tribes. I mean, we're talking about shamans and priests in the right in the in the early tribes. They're, they're having to answer that question: How come you know? How come we don't all speak the language? Particularly because they're also really pushing. Um, they're really starting to push a monotheistic god. And so, if God, if there's one God, how come there's not one language? Um, and we have to. You know, and it's the same thing as, well, why is it raining so hard, and why is there thunder and lightning? Well, God did it, right? There, there's the lightning God and the thunder God, or why is there drought? Well, we did something, and, and the rain gods are withholding the, the, wa the, the rain from us, so we have to appease the rain god, so it's, it, becomes, you know, it becomes very effortless to, um, to blame it on God. Good. Um, they also, so, and so... Um, and also remember that we're talking about this part of the world, the Fertile Crescent, that was constantly being run over by different people, different groups from all directions, north, south, east. Um, all, the, all of these people were um, running uh, through there, and so they were leaving behind languages, leaving behind their descendants. Okay, good. Uh, and besides answering the question, why are there so many languages? Clearly, there is a, um, there's a pejorative piece to the story, right? There's a, they, uh, they tried to build their tower to God, and they didn't, and, and it didn't work. So what's the, what, why do we think that they might have, why would the Jews have been telling that particular story that particular way? <coughs> Well, it could have been, you know, they were trying to teach, you know, you can't physically get to God. Don't try that because you can't do it. Right. Good. Good. And we're going to talk more about that when we get to sort of the spiritual, metaphysical point of the story. Um, we might culturally also think that because it was all the other people who didn't, weren't able to make the tower work, um, that there's a little bit of a, we have a direct line to God, they don't. Because their direct line didn't work. They tried to build it. Ha ha! How stupid! Clearly, you can't do that. But but we actually, you know, we have we're we're the chosen people. We have that we have that direct line. Um, and so then again, you see part of that sort of wanting to exclude ourselves, make ourselves separate from you know all the many things that are going on around us. David. Yeah, I, was, I noticed that there seems to be a repeated theme throughout a number of parts of Genesis where they were wanting to somehow commune with God, and they did it by stacking rocks or building an altar. There was something about raising something up uh, that brought it some kind of communion. Good. And, um, you know, they did even when there was a story where people were having a disagreement and they raised something between them. And, and they always do that with altars, stacking of rocks and something. Sure, and if, and, and if we go back to an earlier conversation about the, the way in which we see the, um, the, um, gro or the, the growth and understanding of God in Western culture, right? We started out with God in the valleys and God in the, the, you know, the particular God of this particular lake, and then pretty soon we've God in the mountains. And then remember that at one point God lifts off the mountains, and then, and then the notion of, a, of an, um, an animistic God or even a pantheistic god at that point is it, the next step. The next step is a transcendent god. God lifts off the mountains, and so progressively, starting from you know, I have to appease the water gods to make sure that there's no flood. It's very here and now, right, grounded in the earth. Progressively, we've seen God move more and more and more transcendently. And so, of course, if we think that that's how we, if that's how we understand God then we have to build upward. Uh, and in the Western tradition, um, and well, and even in the Eastern tradition, a lot of our spirituality is upward, um, up to God, up to enlightenment. And um, there's a sense of transcending or, 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 or um, um, moving beyond or above the physical world, uh, which is, of course, one of the things that I think is so amazing about the science of mind is that we don't do that. We're actually seeking to bring heaven to earth and recognizing that heaven is already on earth and that those are two sides of the same coin rather than saying this there's something wrong here and we're going someplace outside of this realm. Lynn? Well the other thing 
in this story, in my version of the Bible anyway, it says, and the Lord came down to the city. So you sort of have this echo of the Garden of Eden in that God comes down to look around and see what they're doing. So it's a little bit disjoint that the people are building a tower to the heavens, but meanwhile God is just coming down and checking it out. So when you look at the story literally, <clears throat> you see that um, the people telling the story still have this God that comes down and walks among them. And so they're not really, they're not really seeing him as a transcendent God at, at this point. It's really the same God that we met back in the first chapter. There's yes, there's certainly there's certainly the transcendence isn't complete, not by any means, because we can excuse me we can still talk to God, walk with God, um, and of course um, uh, where, where we'll see that change, we'll see that that move will have been completed in Moses, right? Because when Moses comes <coughs> to um, and, um, and, and Moses is told by the presence of God, turn your face away, you can't see me, it's too much. That is where we see that com you know, really complete experience of the transcendence of God. And of course, what do we do immediately as human beings? We build, we build golden calves, right? Because we want actually God to be here. We want somehow God to be accessible to us in some form or fashion. Uh, and, and that, you know, so yes, you're exactly right. We're still, we're definitely seeing that, um, uh, a remnants of that, no question about it. Good, good, okay. So if we think about this now from a metaphorical or spiritual standpoint, and um, we might want to take a look at the fact that, um, that we have moved from the deluge, right? The, pa the Tower of Babel is as follows, almost directly on the heels of the, of the flood. And, um, and remember what we talked about, the, the, um, the notion from a spiritual point of view that the flood is um, somehow representative of the subconscious, the psychic realm, the, um, and maybe the idea that um, people were really enamored by that, really trying to um, experience life and experience the reality, commune with God in that form or fashion. Um, and perhaps, you know, the wickedness we talked about, perhaps the um, overuse of that or not, um, uh, not being spiritually grounded or spiritually aligned with all of that. Um, and so then we have the story of the deluge, the, the, um, the subconscious, actually the psychic realm becomes too much and it simply sweeps everything away. So, so, so now we have the Tower of Babel, red bricks. And remember, what did we learn about red earth? It's the, Adam was made from the red earth, from the physicality of life. Um, and so, you know, so part of it here is also um, a um, recognition, or at least it's a caution, and, and uh, Mike, I think you said it, it's a caution that, 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 in the deluge, the necessarily purely egoically driven psychic subconscious use of the law isn't necessarily the way to go because we have the flood. But now, okay, we've retreated from that. We're just, we're just going to build, physically build a way to God. Yeah, not so much, right? <laughs> Because you can't build it tall enough, God really isn't out there. I mean, like, where is God? And particularly now, as we know. I mean, I don't know, have you ever seen that um, somebody's calculated that if at, the, if at the resurrection, Jesus had been actually drawn from the earth, resurrected from the earth, and was moving at the speed of light, that right now he'd just be passing Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, so up to what? Up to where? Oh, up to, I mean, really, I mean, physically, physically you can't get there. And where is it that we're trying to get? Of course, from the teachings of Jesus, we know that. Where we're trying to get is the kingdom of heaven. We're trying to get back to the garden, but we want to get back to the garden. We want to get to the garden consciously. We want to choose that. And, and, and when we get to Jesus, we'll see that he calls that, that conscious choice to commune with life to be in alignment with spiritual truth he calls that the kingdom of heaven and um and um we can't get there physically 
although we might try, and, and, and we might actually try to do this in our own lives, mm -hmm. right? How many times does it, do we feel like sometimes, well, we haven't been able to manipulate our way into what we want, so now by God we're simply going to make it happen. We're going to do the steps and do the thing and make the the the, the and we're going to make it happen. Pardon me. What, it's good, absolutely, even if it kills me. I'm going to work 80 hours a week, and I am going to get this promotion, and I'm going to make my business work, and I'm going to, and I'm, because I'm going, I now um, feel, so I believe somehow that my only answer is this physical making, doing it. Um, and so once again, we have sort of a cautionary tale, doing it purely from the subconscious m mind, um, the manipulation on the self psychic realm, yeah, not so much. And now we see just absolutely doing it from a pure, purely physical standpoint um, doesn't get us there either. And um, it is doomed to failure. So from Thomas Troward, Bible, Bible Mystery, Bible Meaning, he says this, he has this great quote, which I, I pulled out. I thought it was really lovely. And this is directly about the, the Tower of Babel. Language is the expression of thought. And if our ideas of reality include nothing more than the infinitude of secondary causes which appear in the material world, there is no central unity which, around which they can be grouped. And consequently, instead of any certain knowledge, we have only a multiple of conflicting opinions based upon the ever-changing aspects of world appearances. So, so let's unpack that for a minute. If language is the expression of thought, right? We, and we talk about the power of the word. We, we use the word to name things. Um, and that's when we do our spiritual mind treatment. We do our prayer work. It's all, it's all about not that you use the right language, but that you use language that means something to you, that represents the mental equivalent you're, spe you're seeking to experience. So language is the expression of thought. If our ideas of reality include nothing more than the infinitude of secondary causes. So who's, who's studied Thomas Troward? Does anybody in the class study Thomas Troward? What do you remember about secondary causes? Do you remember? Okay. So, so in Science of Mind, if we have our Science of Mind teaching symbol. Thank you, Robbie, for putting this up for me because you never know when I'm going to use it. That's right. Better safe than sorry. Better safe than sorry, right? Our fabulous teaching symbol about which I can't, I can't talk, I can't, I can't basically teach a class without it. Um, remember, right, spirit, spirit, soul, and body. And when we're talking about cause, we put it up here, don't we? The seed, the impulsion, right, all those things. And, and we talk about first cause. So first cause, like the spiritual cause behind something, the original cause. So on the one hand, this is God saying, let there be light, let there be earth, let there be this, let there be that. It's like the, it's like the beginning of any creative series, first cause. And then through the creative process, through the law, it manifests itself, okay? So um, now, what happens when... Um, what happens when you're wandering around in your life and you, um, and you, get, um, you get laid off from your job? This is a condition of the world. And you suspect it all along that your boss didn't really like you. And you start telling the story. Well, you know, I got laid off from my job and they said it was because of the economy and the but I knew my boss didn't really like me. And then we go into a depression. And then we start looking for new jobs, and we can't find a job because we're so pissed off about the job that we lost. That is secondary cause. That's a secondary causation, something that has happened that's actually a condition which we have now made a cause in our life. I can't get a job because that so-and-so fired me. I can't get a job because I'm too old. I can't get a job because I don't have enough experience. I can't get a, I can't get a job because I don't have an education. Um, or um, 
you're with your partner, you're with your partner at a, um, at a party, and your partner gets all interested and enamored with somebody and is all excited and having a great conversation, and they're, you know, discovering that they, like, you know, are long-lost brothers or whatever it is, and then you go home and you have a rip-roaring fight. And you realize finally the next day that the reason that you picked that fight with your partner was because they didn't pay any attention to you at the party. That, ha that experience, that thing that happened at the party, that's called secondary cause. It is turning a condition, an experience, into the cause of then the next thing, the next set of behaviors, the next, um, the next creative process. The fight would be the secondary cause, right? No, the, the, the fact that you ignored me for a whole two hours at the party having so much fun talking to somebody else and I needed actually for you to pay attention to me. That's the secondary, That's the secondary, secondary cause. cause. And what it caused was me coming, going home and finding that thing that you did and that now just launched me into a fight with you. Okay. Because rather than confronting the fact that, A, you didn't pay attention to me, and even confronting behind that the need that I had of you to pay attention to me, okay. I simply picked a fight with you. Okay. Do you see? The, the, second, the, the fight is actually the, the, the new plant. It's yeah. actually the new result of the secondary cause. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Um, so, um, so there's, I mean, anything can be secondary causation. Any condition of the physical world that we allow <laughs> to become the beginning of a new creative process is secondary cause. So it's always made up? Um, well, it's our interpretation, interpretation of it certainly <laughs> is, um, is limited to the human experience of it. Okay. We're actually not looking at it from the spiritual point of view. Okay. And so what was happening is we have a plant that actually is then, it's, you know, this is what's happening, like this, instead of setting a new cause in motion, setting a new cause in motion, com or coming back to spirit. We're actually allowing this thing in our experience to become causal. Mike. So would you say when we have things in our lives that say I do lose a job, all, all the things I would interpret as negative, all from secondary cause? Because none of them are spiritually true. Right? Any, any, any interpretation that I have other than I lost my job is secondary cause. The primary is I lost the job. No, the primary cause would be um, I, seek act, I, seek, I seek employment, I seek a job in my life. Because that is not contingent upon any condition. So I lose a job, right, to start the process from first cause would be to say, wow, I lost a job. I choose to be employed. I choose to have a job. I choose to get a job. I choose to attract the perfect job to me. And, and I really, I may learn from that experience. I may want to learn from that if there's something that I can learn about how to be or not to be, but, but I'm not predicating this job on the loss of that job. Well, you know, the bosses are always a jerk now, you know, and I don't know that I want to work for you, and so I don't take this job and I don't take that job, and all the stories that we tell ourselves about how hard it is to find a job, and nobody wants us anyway, and right, that are all negative reactions to losing the job, because the losing of the job is simply the experience. And now it's, it becomes secondary cause if we make it the cause of the next go around of the creative process. Rather than spirit is unlimited, there's an unlimited number of ways in which the universe spirit is going to express through me, therefore I am now attracting to myself the perfect new job. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Tower of Babel in, on a very personal note, on a very personal level, Thomas Troward is, um, is, is saying, if the Tower of Babel is us, we operate like the Tower of Babel to ourselves when we are being run by secondary causes. It's all those little voices. 
It's all those little, you know, thoughts that are pulling us and pushing us and doing, say, do this and do that. And you should, and all those different um, push-pull things, right? That, that's what our life looks like and feels like when we're being run by secondary causes. And can we get to the kingdom of heaven? Not so much. It doesn't work because there's no central unity around which they are grouped, which is what's the central unity, right? The wholeness of God, the presence of spirit, the presence of the one. And so instead of, instead of certain knowledge, which is our connection with the whole, we have a multiple of conflicting opinions based upon the ever-changing aspects of the world of appearances. So then I get a job, and oh, now I'm happy again, and I feel great, and then I lose the job, and now I'm not happy anymore, and I feel terrible, and then I get the job, and then I feel like I'm really constructive, and I'm really, I'm really, I really have something to offer, and then, uh, then there's a massive layoffs again, and oh, I'm sunk to the pit of despair, and I'm not worth anything, and I'm no good. Do you see, that's a string of secondary causes. And we become the, um, we're like a puppet pulled on the string of secondary causes. And, and our job spiritually is always to come back to alignment with the spiritual truth, the unity, the unifying principle, which brings us together with ourselves, which brings us together with the alignment with spirit, right? Which, is, which then we have an entirely different experience. Then we actually are living in the garden, we're living in the kingdom of heaven, um, and we're not having this experience of this multiple you know, pull um, um, or this, this um, you know, roller coaster. And we've had it, you know, we've had it in jobs and we've had it in relationships and we've had it with our family. And, you know, you, we, we can all name at least one area in our life where we've had that experience, where we've been run by secondary causes. Um, Excuse me. Yes. Are you saying that the, uh, the languages then is the busyness? The language is the, is the, um, expression of thought that we have. So it is the thought that we have about all of these things that are happening in our life. I stub my toe, I feel bad, oh gosh, it's just life is so hard. I, I, I have this job and I really love it. Wow, I feel really good. And my bank account isn't what I thought it should be and so now I'm down in the dumps again. But I have this fabulous relationship so I feel really good. Do you see? It's what I'm, it's my thought that I'm having about all of these no, I things. I really like what you're saying and I really like that. But I mean the metaphor itself yes. of the languages it's is the, the busyness of our lives. No, the language is the thought we have around those things. Are we making them causal? Okay, we, so not the actual experience, but the thought of the experience. Exactly. Are we making those, those experiences causal in our lives about something? Rather than simply letting it be what it is, right? The power of now. That's the, the deep, deep um, um, relationship that we have with Buddhism and the power of now. Is, it, it, it simply is what it is. And, and, and if I, and I want to reacquaint myself then in this moment of isness with what spiritual truth? Oh, I've lost my job. Well, what spiritual truth? Well, spirit is always active. Oh, I have this great relationship. Well, what spiritual truth? Well, this is love in action. And, and so I'm, do you see what I'm saying? My thought is always bringing me back to the unifying principle rather than me being on the waves of all of these experiences but it's my thought about those experiences that's the problem. Does that make sense? Because that's what's causal. It's what we think about it, how we react to it, how we respond to it. And so I want to use thought, again, I want to use that word lightly, right? It's not just, oh, I am now having a thought, but it's any, any uh, movement in consciousness, any reaction, any belief system, any beliefs that we create around it, right? Thought is a very large term. Um, that we're using here. The stories we tell ourselves and <laughs> about what mm -hmm, happened. Mm -hmm. Or the knee-jerk reaction, emotional, mm, that we get about it, or... Good, good. Okay, so it's a brilliant metaphor when you think of the Tower of Babel that way. Because um, remember that this, you know, we're looking at this, these stories as the story of the evolution of consciousness as a whole. 
and then, and then also the evolution of our individual consciousness. So we are all the characters in the story, you know, from Adam and Eve all the way around to Jesus. Um, we are all those characters. And so it's our own individual consciousness growth, um, and, then it's, and then it's our consciousness collectively um, as, as, hum, as a human race, as human beings, that, that we can begin to see now how, we're, how we want to start um, looking at the physical and the material world differently. Um, so, so you got a worksheet last night, a uh, last class. There was a worksheet last class. I'm hoping that you have it with, with you. It's called the Threefold Nature of Life Worksheet. This, this worksheet. Yes? So I would like for you to pull this worksheet out. I'm sure RJ made extra copies for those of us who don't have it. <laughs> I have one. I can make a copy. Does anybody else need a copy? I need a copy. Two, two, three, uh, six, nine, two, eight. Six, nine, two, eight. Okay, while well, Leslie is running up. Um, yep, uh huh. Yep, and it's got a whole list of things down the side, a whole list of aspects of areas of life down the side. And it, we're going to make it's making, we're making a little graph. We're going to give you instructions momentarily. I'm going to give you instructions momentarily. Okay. Does everybody have theirs out? She's making copies. I hope she thinks to make a few extras. Should I follow up and make sure? What do you think? I'm happy to do that. Better safe than sorry. Yeah, just a few. It sounds like a couple other people aren't finding theirs. Okay, so, um, so what I'd like for you to do, this is an opportunity in um, really honest self-assessment. Okay, so this is an opportunity for us to ask ourselves in these areas of life, this whole list that we have down the left hand side, how do you make decisions or take actions in this area? From which place? So for example, health. The minute that you have a health issue, do you immediately go to a physical, something physical? I, I stub my toe, I have to take an aspirin. Do you immediately go to something emotional and mental? I stub my toe. Um, I wonder what I was thinking that caused me to stub my toe. Do you immediately go to um, the spiritual? I stub my toe. Um, spirit is the wholeness of my body, and it's completely now bringing my toe back into perfect alignment so that it doesn't, doesn't hurt. Um, and, and you might do more than one of these things, but, but what we want to look at is where do we go first? Where do we go first? Some, some areas we, we will... I think we'll, you know, mostly be different places. Like some areas we might immediately go to spiritual truth. Other areas, maybe finances, it's like, well, you know, I look at my checkbook and my paycheck. That's how I deal with my finances. I mean, it's like, it's like physical reality. Um, or or I, 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 I really, really, really understand the abundance of the universe. I totally get that I live in an abundant universe. And everything, every time I deal with my finances, I'm, I'm grounded in spiritual truth. So, um, so, so we just want to take a self-assessment. Does that make sense to you? Do you have questions about that? Yeah, or the most often. Let's say the most often. Maybe you, maybe you go first to like something physical, but then you crank yourself around to like, oh, well, let me think about what I'm thinking about about this. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, yeah. Can so raise your hand, please, if you need a copy. So you need a copy. Um, what would be the emotional, mental equivalent for finances? Well, I, I, you know, you have to think about it. Do you immediately go to, oh my God, I just don't ever have enough. Gosh, I just wish I could make more money. I just don't know how to make more money. You know, do you immediately like start like obsessing about it, thinking about it, you know, trying to figure out what, what you might, how you might, you know, look at it differently. Um, 
or do you just go, okay, I've got this much and I gotta check my checkbook and I got my paycheck and this is what I've got and I don't have any more. Does that make sense? And and we you gotta scale, you know, you've got to scale there. And 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 if you want to be creative about how you mark it up, there's not a right answer here. If you decide if you wanna you know, say I mostly do physical, but sometimes I do emotional too, or gosh, I really do spiritual, but occasionally I'm, you know, that's okay too. But I would just want to take a self-assessment. So please to have fun with that for a few minutes. At your table, um, what did you notice? Did anything surprise you? What did you discover? Um, and uh, just have an opportunity to explore together at your table um, how you respond or how you uh, work with, fr from which place do you work with these areas of your life? All right, so just go ahead. Illuminated, what, what did you discover? What was illuminated by doing this worksheet? I'm not very spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps not yet. No, <laughs> it depends where we're at. I am very spiritual on something. You know what's really impressive on that? Speaking of work, spiritual. I, I've been unemployed for a number of years, but when I did work, I never, spiritual never came into my work. And I can see now, I'm so impressed when a person could say spiritual yeah. as a career. What else? What did you think? What came out of this was uh, how we all interpreted it differently in terms yeah. of what we were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But what actually happened was that we recognized there's a difference between being in a, in a steady state, a comfortable, secure place, and if I'm dealing like with my finances when I'm in a secure place, I'm actually dealing with the good emotions, the spiritual truth about the abundance that's out there, and it's fine. But I go out to the mailbox and pick up a letter that says IRS on it, suddenly I react physically because I've got those reactions, and I react emotionally, but I work my way back towards where I want to be, but you can't help that whole body experience from coming into play. So it's not a question of what your first reaction is. The circumstances can dictate that to you. But it's more a question of where you end up. Um, okay, so I'm going to really push back on a, a number of things that you said. Um, the first one was there's nothing you can do about those reactions. Uh, I um, um, that, that the, the, as long as you say that, that will be your experience. Um, but my, my experience, my belief, and my personal reality is that is not true. Um, we can't, and we, and, and, and so, so it's exactly that kind of thing because that, that makes us want to really look at this. It's easy to stay in this, to have spirituality be the locus of where our identity lives when things are going well. It is always when we're confronted with something that's uncomfortable. That is the question, where do I go? So Robbie and I were talking about this. Can you talk about, talk about your um, response about health and the pollen? Oh yes, um, <clears throat> I believe in these things called pollen and I believe that I'm allergic to them. And so I get migraines and I've had asthma and these are all, and I notice that when I'm dealing with something new that's you know, out of the blue, it's, it, I go spiritual. But when it comes to these chronic things that I've had for 30, 40 years, whatever, I, I'm, I totally believe in them. And so I suffer the consequences of believing in them. And so the so locus so. of her identity around the allergy is I'm a person who has allergies. So the locus of our identity is in her physical reality. But when it's something new that hasn't been chronically, she hasn't struggled with chronically, it's a lot easier for, her to, for the locus of her identity to be in her spiritual truth. Oh, well, everybody else is getting the flu, but I don't get the flu because yeah. I'm God expressing, so I don't need to get the flu. I'm perfectly healthy. And, um, and, and so it's that kind of thing that we really want to ask ourselves um, because I actually know people who no longer believe that pollen impacts them and actually aren't allergic anymore. They don't have that reaction because they aren't living in that identification, and um, and so it's not it's not so much it's not we're not so much talking about do I have a visceral reaction to it, um, but we're talking about where 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 are we living? What are we making causal in our life? Right. Well, this is because we're talking here about causality. What are we making causal in our life? And it is completely possible to 
have a great experience with your finances, go out and get a letter from the IRS and not have a visceral reaction. Not have a physical reaction, not have a mental or emotional reaction, and simply go, oh, I have a letter from the IRS, I wonder what this is. And, and come from that place of complete trust, whatever, you know, spirit is always present, so, so I mean, not even, not even go to any other place other than, oh, well, here's a letter, I wonder what this is. Two and a half years, December 2008, I was actually released for a good paying job. That was two years, and I think everybody heard during the EIS stuff that I'd gotten a new one. But even when I was, you know, so I'm coming down the aisle, said, Alan, come with me. I had no visceral reaction to it. I knew that everything was going to be taken care of. I wasn't worried about things at all. So it doesn't mean you have to fall into that, but it's acknowledgement that there are going to be some things that we're not prepared for that potentially are going to fall into those categories if we're not prepared for it. But I was, at that time, obviously prepared for it. Thanks. So I would, again, suggest that you don't affirm that. I'm, I seek to always be prepared that no matter what happens in my life, I respond from a spiritual perspective. Why would I want to respond from any other place? So it's building now, a platform from out of the experiences in which we already have that, that allows us to be able to... No, because now we're walking. If we're building a platform of the experiences we've had, we are now building our platform from secondary causes. No, I'm talking about building a platform from where we stand first cause yes okay that then influences all those other kinds of experiences we have and starts to give us that chance to not react viscerally yes okay and and i really want to affirm for us all of us that we actually can live there now we are growing into that space but but i don't want to affirm from any of us that well if you're gonna if you if, if you're unprepared you're gonna go you're gonna have that experience it's not required. It really isn't. That is the shift in consciousness from Adam all the way to, to the spiritual place of Jesus. When you see me, you see the Father. I am the Father of one. Nothing that I do. There's nothing that I do. It is all the Father within me. So no matter how unprepared I am, whatever comes up, what comes out of my mouth and out of my response is the spiritual reality first cause. That's where we're growing to. That's, that is the, and, and of course, yes, as, as our paper shows us, that there are places where we are more comfortable with that and, than others. There are places where, we're, where that's a little more effortless. Um, and, um, and, 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 and I think, uh, Robbie, when we were talking about it, was, I th it was a good point. Things that are chronic, why? Because we are conditioned. What does that make that condition? Secondary causation. That's what a condition means. It's secondary causation. It is a cause that keeps, that we keep giving power to over and over and over again. Why? Because we believe it's true. That's what makes it causal in our life. That which we believe is true is what is causal in our life. And so we're constantly seeking to move to no matter what's going on, what's true is God is present, spirit is all there is, spirit knows how to do all of these things. So whatever spiritual truth um, we, you know, we want to be responding to, we want to be coming from. Um, and it's just really, I think it's really fascinating. So, so when we, Robbie and I were talking about it, I noticed that from in relationships and work, I like live in spirituality. I totally get that. I totally get in my relationship, that's God, this is God, we're having a little tiff, no matter how mad I am, uh, it is absolutely crystal clear to me that, that, that that's God over there and this is God over here and, uh, you know, and, and if I've really gotten mad or really gotten hooked, I'm just not living in that place. And it takes me minutes or hours at the most to regroup, reground, and for, for my work as well. Um, I notice for myself, Finances, yeah, I'm still working on that. Health, for health, man, I, it is physical. Right now, you got a headache. Oh, do you want an aspirin? Yeah. Shall I? Get, do, you, do you got a backache? Let's go to the chiropractor. <laughs> you need a. You stubbed your toe. Oh, I'm so sorry. Get you ice. I mean, I go to the physical instantly, and I really have to stop and think about. Oh, maybe we should do treatment about this. <laughs> I, I don't go there. And so I'm work that's a place where I'm really working on 
do you see that I want to, I want to, when I have the experience, let's say, of like cut myself and I'm like, oh my God, I should put iodine on it and have to get a band aid, then I have to get, should I get a shot? Do I need a tetanus shot? I mean, I'm just, I just want, I just go there. Do you see? So I'm living in, in my health, I'm living mostly causally from the physical reality. Um, and um, and and so so just we just had the opportunity to talk about those first four really to talk about those first four, um, and so I can see in my life right and and so that's what we've been talking about with the with the flood living from that sort of mental and emotional state and the Tower of Babel living from the purely physical state, um, and we are wanting to move to that place where we really are living from where our we're really living, the locus of our identity is from, is the spiritual reality. Um, and, and then no matter what happens, that doesn't mean we don't, you know, get frustrated or angry or have good things happen, bad things happen, whatever. But in each case, we're always, you know, our, our, our primary um, locus of identity, our primary place of identity um, is our spiritual place. That's where we, that's where we're going. That's what we're growing to. Rhonda? Um, so... Fear and anger, I mean, if you're experiencing those, you're not spiritually grounded. So is it, I mean, this is my assumption. So um, then the question of how you respond to that is just how long you would stay there. You know, it's like as soon as you realize that you're angry or you realize that you're yeah, experiencing fear. Yeah, I think what I was thinking about that, um, fear, you know, like in fear, do you, like, do you just really live for a long time in that whole fight or flight, like I'm going to punch you in the nose? You know, or do I, if I get really fearful, do I start like thinking about it? Oh my God, I'm so worried about this. And I spend hours and hours and hours worrying about it, worrying about it, worrying about it. Or do I really go, how? Oh, oh, you know, feel myself fearful and then go, oh, but wait, spirit knows how to do this. So yes, I think it's, you know, it's really where, where are we spending that time and energy when, when these things happen? Um, and when we, when we, or when we find ourselves angry or we find ourselves in some of those, some of those experiences. Does that does that make sense? Does that does that help? Because I I mean I know for myself I mean for years when I was fearful I just like immediately went into fight or flight or freeze, and and I could be I could be paralyzed for weeks just paralyzed I don't know what to do I, everything I'm just I'm, I'm afraid I'm afraid to move I don't know whether, which way to move so I would just be paralyzed so to me that would be that would be marking the physical that that's where I go. And then I would, and then I moved, I really did, I moved to the spiritual, the, to mental emotional, um, where I would have to think about it, and I would worry about it, I would think about it, and I would worry about it, and I would think about it, and I would worry about it, and I would think about it, and I would worry about it, and I would think about it, and I could do that for weeks or months, I could do that, right? So that's what I'm just trying to get us to illuminate for ourselves. Because any time that we're doing any of those other things, besides simply living from spiritual truth, we are cultivating, we are living out of secondary causation. I'm having this reaction because the IRS thing came in the mail. I'm having this reaction because I'm fearful. I'm doing this thing because I'm afraid. Do you see? And I've, I'm making these conditions causal in my life. And our job is to unhook from them, unhook from them, unhook from them, unhook from them over and over and over again um, because we are moving to the place where we understand the truth of our being. Uh, Jesus um, understood the truth. The Father and I are one. When you see me, you see the Father. This, I that I am, I that I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The I am that I am um, is, is the causal reality. Uh, so, all right, anything else? What else? What else? Anything to share, explore, talk about mercy. Did you all talk about, um, I was sitting on 635 while you all were probably talking about your worksheet that you did, the 70 times 70? Oh, did you yeah. all? Yeah. Good. Okay, because I wanted to link that with this. I think it links. I did, um, I released my belief in lack and limitation. I released my need to overwork. And by overwork included me giving myself away at work, staying too long, working harder than my clients do, thinking I have to fix them all, and just being done and used up by the end of the day, and resentful. And I decided to, I wanted to change the belief, I think. And what happened was, I think I came out of, I think I shifted in my work from being very physical to being spiritual because the, I did, I took this very seriously, and I did the 70s on set. 
And what happened was I sort of relaxed at work. I, 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 I knew that was a great little worksheet that you gave us that last time because I knew what was going on was that I was not enough. I was not, a, I was not good enough and they may find me out. And what happened was I began to not be so good. Uh, there was a little tinge of going back into the worry, which was, um, oh dear, I wonder if I've been fair. Am I cheating? Is my timesheet exactly correct here? And, but, uh, but I, would, I, I had to work this. And I would go back to the, I release my need to overwork. And I think that's what you're talking about, about not having that automatic uh, gut thing. Because I gotta tell you, the IBS and the worry and in the morning and Sunday afternoon, I start worrying about Monday morning and that is easing a little. And I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly, because then that worry doesn't, isn't causal in your life. Right, it's not creating all the anxiety and the physical symptoms and the, I don't want to go to work and oh my God and blah, blah, blah and, and, and then not doing your job well or d overdoing it or, you know, because that, when we're living there, that's what's, that's the cause. That is what's driving how you show up. And so as you relax and you recognize, wait, God is the, what was the last one for you? God is the what I am? God is the peace. I'm grateful to God. God is, the peace, God is the peace that I am. Now I can begin to show up as peace in my workplace. And that's a whole different way to show up. It's a whole different place to stand. And then when peace is what's causal, now I respond to everything differently. Good for you. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to break those conditioning, that conditioning. Um, that, more conscious. Yes. Just raising my awareness of where, where am I operating from here? I basically was operating from panic yes. most of the day in the, in the survival mode. Good. And I, Good. And, and, and I didn't want to do that Good. anymore. And survival mode is right, purely physical. Make sure that all my needs are met. Panic is that sort of physical border lining into emotional. Um, and, and when we're living there, what kind of a life are we having? What kind of a life experience are we having? How much fun is that? <laughs> And we get ulcers, and we get all kinds of physical symptoms, and you know, on and on and on the list goes. Uh, and so what we're trying to do through this whole process of understanding the evolution of consciousness, we're trying to wake up, become conscious of spiritual truth, and move to the place where that's the truth of who we are, to the best of our ability. Absolutely to the best of our ability. Because right? we are growing into that. Thanks for sharing that, Marcy. That was really great. That was really, really great. Leslie. Can I do a shout out to that 70 times seven? Yes, I did yes. that. <laughs> and it was, it's unbelievable. I would never have believed this if it wasn't me. My, my thing was God quality of abundance. A stranger gave me money. Somebody in this church gave me money. I got, I got free tickets to something that I, to, I found a gift card that I had lost. I got, I got 12 things. It was freaky. I mean, it was a little freaky. <laughs> like, I was like, amazing. we're so surprised. It was, works oh my works. God, this stuff works. I mean, it, was, uh, it was freaky. So, yeah. Yay. So, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Yeah. That is, um, yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. 70 times 7. Yeah, yeah. I'm still doing it. Good. Yeah. Good. Any other sharings about that? Any other experiences about doing your um, releasing prayer that anybody else wants to uh, talk about? Share? I hope you're doing it. I hope you did it. It's because it's really awesome. Avis. I noticed that, um, you know, Marcy and Leslie, I'm so inspired. And I noticed that um, what I wrote on that sheet, because I hadn't looked at that sheet since we did that sheet. And, but it was the same thing I'd asked my prayer group to support me in. Exactly, that dynamic. So I... I declare and I know that this is mine and I'm doing that. So you guys, I'm taking it to the <laughs> accountability group here in our closet about this. 70 times 7. Good. Do it every day. 70, 70 times, times. Yeah, that's right. Every day. And this will happen. Yes, because what we're doing is we are breaking our conditioning. We're breaking our habitual. Ultimately, it is the habitual place with which we identify. 
That's that, that in the final analysis, the deepest truth is what do we identify, who do we identify with, what do we identify ourselves with. And when we stand in a different identification, we respond differently. Good. Good for you, Avis. Okay, we'll check in with you. <laughs> Fabulous. I Celeste. The first one so much, I started the second one. Good. And I, after hearing all this other stuff, I think, I hadn't thought about work, but I th that's a good one, too. Excellent. It, excellent. It is. It mm -hmm. is. You can do this Spirit of Faith worksheet about anything in your life. Um, and really come to the what's the releasing prayer, what, you know, what's the belief you're holding on to, what's the behavior that comes out of that belief, and where, what is the spiritual truth upon which you seek to stand. Uh, and um, it is absolutely transformative. Yay. And for me, it Good. sort of evolved. It started out as one thing, because I wasn't really sure whether I was supposed to do the exercise. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but I, I, I had something in mind just in case I got called into action, and I did. Uh -huh. um, and then over the course of days, it became clearer to me really what I was really what I was looking at and what I was really needing to change. And so I changed it a little bit. It went from being my to being the because I no longer wanted to claim it as mine. Yeah. It was the belief and the need, not mine. Um, but it evolved and it, and it became more and more powerful as I focused in more and more clearly on exactly what was going on there. Good, absolutely. And it, and it is an ongoing, uh, it is an ongoing thing. And I came right up against that fear yes. during that process. And I mean, I was in a full-scale panic, you know, heart pounding, oh my God. Um, and I just started, I just, just started do doing it. And I Good did it and I 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 did it and when my, I, I did 35 a day for two weeks, okay. Yeah, good for um, you. And then when I did my 35, I sat down and did what I, what, what I was yeah. so afraid of doing. Good, good for you. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, I mean, and then our prayer gives us an anchor that shifts us, right, moves us, reminds us where it is we want to stand. Where do we want to be standing? What do we want to have be cause in our life? Do we want this panic to be cause in our life? Or do we want peace to be cause in our life? Do we want panic to be cause in our life? Or do we want trust or abundance or hope or, you know, whatever that is? And, and we're, that, I mean, that, that is fundamentally, that is the fundamental choice that we have. Primarily, that is the fundamental choice that we were given in the Garden of Eden. Um, the, the, the knowledge of these, the knowledge of these pairs of opposites. And that we can actually choose the one that we want to have causal in our life. What do you want to have driving the bus, right, of your life? Good. Yay. Is there a color activity that goes with that? Yes, there's there is. some kind of color thing on there. Yes, and, and it should say on the bottom, it may not, but if you look at the little, like there's a little letter inside mm -hmm. each of them, and the P is pink and the O is orange, oh. and, and um, because that's a part of what makes it a whole brain activity, right? The coloring really um, accesses your right brain. And so, if you if you want to do the coloring in, it it can just it can it's just a way of just absorbing, processing, re-being with it again in another way. So just look at those little um, those little mark marks. So P is not never for purple. So it's, if there's a V, it's violet, because otherwise you'd have pink and purple. So it's P is for pink. Um, and if you are a person of color, you you can certainly make the the you don't have to make the skin pink. You could make it brown. But they, they, they chose pink because people's hands and tongue are pink. So, but it's, you know, it's, so it's just an opportunity to, to, to go deeper into the process. Okay. What else? What else? Anything else about that? I think for me, my, my prayer took me down an entirely different path because I've been struggling with the, uh, the potential of finding a new home for my horse due to a lameness issue for, that's gone on for five years. And um, where it all took me was actually led me down a path of listening to a internet radio show and a whole new method of looking at um, trimming and shoeing and looking at the whole body. And so I actually pursued that and um, 
you know, for the first time in over a year, he picked up a right lead last Sunday. Oh. So, you know, it was like, well, you know, because he thinks that he can heal from it. So it was like, all right, what do I need to do? So instead of looking for a new home with potential of getting a different horse, we're just seeing what we're going to do for him instead. So, yeah, so, so the confusion, so the, so, you cause emotion. Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole confusion and, and turmoil yeah. within myself of what's right to do for him, you know, and it's, it, yeah, take, going down that path just changed all that. So. Um, so, just to also want to remind you, of course, that any time that you want to go through this, like the Fear to Faith worksheet, any practitioner will run you through it and work you through it. We've all done it here. You can ask your, um, if you, you know, if you feel confident, you can ask a, a, um, a classmate to do it. Um, but I, I don't usually like to run myself through it. I, I really like for somebody to be walking me through it, so I can just really be with what comes up. So I'm, so I'm pulling up what's the truest. Um, answers. What's the what are the re most real answers? Um, and any time that you're confronted with something, uh, it's a great it's a great thing to do. And then do your prayer work. Good, fabulous. Okay, so we have now uh, managed to complete last week. So that's great. <laughs> so yay, yay, yay. All right. Um, so I think what we'll do then is we'll go ahead and take our break. And, um, and after the break, we'll start this week. 